three, two, and one. Okay? So, you know, we have never talked about ionic bonds in this class so far, but at least one person is going to select ionic bonds in go between molecules, all right? Let's see. Oh, look at that, six. More than six. Right, anyway, all right. Now, now, here's the thing. Ionic bonds are occurring between ions. We have never talked about them yet. We're going to be talking about this I mean, a little bit later in Unit 3, Module 3, all right? But keep this in mind, covalent bonds are actual bonds, not intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces mean uh, interactions between the molecules, right? But when it comes to covalent bonds, covalent bonds are what are keeping atoms together in the molecule. We talked about this in Unit 2, Module 2, before we talked about IR spectroscopy. Right? So how covalent bond formation decreases both potential energy and kinetic energy and the total energy and so forth, okay? So, but that is gonna be much, much, much stronger compared to any type of intermolecular forces you can think of, all right? We even talked about the strength of the covalent bonds. It's like uh, 200 to 1200 kilojoules per mole. But when it comes to intermolecular forces, the strongest intermolecular forces can only go up to 40 kilojoules per mole. All right, so compared to any like intermolecular forces, covalent bonds are much, much, much stronger. All right, so these are actual bonds. Okay, so please do not select again a verb. Okay, uh, in covalent bonds when we are when they are asking for intermolecular forces. All right, so the correct answers for this question are, are these three: the 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 three intermolecular forces we have discussed in details. All right. I'm going to reopen this question. Meanwhile, what questions, concerns, comments do we have? All right, any questions, concerns, comments? Okay. So now, here's the real question for you today, okay? Uh, you have a question? Yes. Remind me your name, sir, one more time. I'm sorry. Eli, go ahead. Why is it not E? Like, I don't get how it's not E. Covalent bonds are actual bonds not intermolecular forces. There are only three types of intermolecular forces, dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. Covalent bonds is the actual bond between two atoms, not intermolecular forces. But that contributes to the IMF though, right? The no, covalent bonds? No, it's, it's actual bonds. Those are not intermolecular forces, Eli. Right? Covalent bond means if we have like carbon oxygen in, bond is a covalent bond. That is not yeah. intermolecular forces between carbon and oxygen because carbon is an atom. Oxygen is an atom, not intermolecular. Between okay, so atoms. it's just because it's between like one molecule and or like it's in the molecule, not between the molecules. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, you can think right, of it like that. Right. Yes, wonderful. Uh -huh. All right. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Anything else? Yeah? All right. Now, here's a real question. On your whiteboards, can you show me these three types of intermolecular forces between these molecules? Go ahead. I want to see three images. These are three pictures, okay? One for dispersion, one for dipole-dipole, and another one for hydrogen bonding. Go ahead. Um, so there are three types. Dispersion. dipole Dipole, hydrogen bonding. All right. So when it comes to dispersion forces, this is what I would do. So I have, uh, I have one molecule like this. Okay. And here's its electron cloud. And I have another molecule that has this formula. Right? And this is its electron cloud. Okay? And then I randomly assign partial charges to the electron cloud, not to an atom, to the electron cloud. Why? When the electron clouds get closer to each other, they induce partial charges on each other. Okay? Or they, they get perturbed. As a result of that, we're going to get induced partial charges. So I'm going to assign randomly, partially, 
uh, positive here, partially negative, partially positive, and partially negative, and so forth. And then I'm going to draw three dots between the opposite partial charges to show that they are interacting with each other. Right? This is how I would draw dispersion forces. All right. Moving on to dipole-dipole forces. Here's the way I do it. Here's the way I start drawing dipole-dipole forces. I straight up draw my dipole moments. Okay, here's one dipole. Here's another dipole. They don't have to be in a certain angle, but, you know, I, I happen to draw it like that, okay? I just drew two dipo dipoles interacting head to tail. Why? Head is partially negative, tail is partially positive. They are attracted to each other. So this is how I would draw it. And then I would draw the molecule on top of this. So I have uh, one molecule over here. Let's say that I have um, the alcohol here. And then I have the other molecule. So I know my arrowhead should be near oxygen because that's the most electronegative atom. Okay. Um, and then uh, and the other part of the molecule is partially positive. Okay. So arrowhead is always by the oxygen atom. That's why I, mean, I drew it like that. So here's my dipole-dipole forces. And lastly, I have hydrogen bonding. Right. So to draw hydrogen bonding, I can do like this. Oh, I'm going to write like that. It's okay. All right, here's this alcohol molecule over here. And this hydrogen can... So this is the only hydrogen that can hydrogen bond with anything. Why? This is the only hydrogen that is bonded to oxygen, nitrogen or fluorine, in this case oxygen. Okay. So now I have the other molecule, which is the aldehyde, like that. Right. And then that oxygen can have hydrogen bonding interaction with this hydrogen like that. So that would be my hydrogen bonding uh, forces or hydrogen bonding interactions. Brendan. All right, give me a second. So think about this, all right, and then I'll take any questions you might have. Uh, give me like 10 seconds, Brendan, for everybody to think about this and come up with their questions. All right. What questions, concerns, comments do we have? I'm going to start with Brendan, and then now. Uh... Brendan, go ahead. On the dispersion diagram, where are you getting your partial negative charge on the second molecule? Random. Those are totally random. I'm giving the partial charges to the electron cloud. Why? When one electron cloud gets closer to another electron cloud, they perturb each other. When they perturb, they induce partial charges on each other. And opposite partial charges can be attracted, and that gives rise to dispersion forces. Yeah? All right. What other questions, concerns, comments do we have? Yes, yes. Sarah, right? Sarah, go ahead. Sarah. When Sarah. drawing the uh, molecules, do you have to draw them in the line structure when doing the... No, you don't have to, but I find it easier to draw line structures mm -hmm. because it's le less messier. Okay. All right, because otherwise, if you draw the Lewis structure, you have hydrogen coming out, carbon atoms drawn and everything. So that is harder to, you know, you know for me to draw. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, okay. but you don't have to. Thank you. Do you have another question? Yes. Um, Do you remember name so one more time? Oh wait. Oh Renee. Renee, go ahead. Wait for the dispersion for the second one for the second the second line chart in your notes. Wait, why is for the oxygen? Why is it positive if it's no? I didn't even pay attention to where I'm putting my partial charges there. Why? I'm giving the partial charge to the electron cloud, not to an atom. I'm not assigning a partial charge to an atom here. I'm assigning a partial charge randomly to the electron cloud. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Okay. All right. You will have to be able to draw this, okay? We are going to be testing you on this, so you should be able to draw this. And it's not hard. These are like easy points that you can gain, all right? This is all you need to do, yeah? But if you have any questions about drawing them or any confusions, anything that is not clear to you, please ask questions. We'll do our best to clarify them. You have another question? Yes, sir. What's your name, sir? 
Is it more? Oh, yeah. Okay. My name is Pradumna. P Pratumba? No, Pradumna. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm going to come talk but, to you. Okay, that's okay. Um, but uh, anyways, you know that hydrogen that's connected to carbon, why'd you draw it? Didn't you like tell us before that you don't need to draw hydrogens, correct, uh, hydrogens connected to carbon? Yeah, that is true. You don't have to draw them, but you know, pe people usually draw that when they draw aldehydes. Uh, that's, I mean, my muscle memory drew, memory drew it, but if you don't draw it, it's fine. Yeah, I understand. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I, I wasn't even thinking about it. Yeah, he was referring to that hydrogen in the aldehyde. Uh, so maybe some of you are wondering, what do I mean by aldehyde? What the heck is that, right? So when you have this group, okay, that is called an aldehyde group. I posted a video uh, for this, aldehyde, all right? And if you have uh, this group, this is called a hydroxyl group, hydroxyl. Oh, and also while we're talking about this, if you have this group, OH, okay? This group is called, anybody? What do you call this group? I heard that, carboxyl carboxyl group and there's one other group I want to mention because you know that can come in handy that is uh, the this group and it can be NH2 or it can be written as NH and then there's an R attached to it rest of the molecule or maybe like you know maybe multiple R groups okay so these are called amines Okay, so the question was, when I drew this molecule over here, uh, in the line structures, we don't have to draw hydrogen bonded to carbon, but I drew it anyway. The reason is I want to point out the aldehyde group. And, you know, um, when, I, when I draw aldehyde, I always draw like this. And chemists usually draw like that. I think uh, any organic chemist, any TS, is, 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 that's right, right? That's how we draw it? Yeah, okay. Just... All right. Okay. So I just want to point that out. Okay. Now with that, here's what we want to do. Now, uh, I gave you this question before, right? I, I asked you to predict the solubility or whether to, uh, whether these compounds mix or not. Now to do this, we use a mantra. I call it a mantra. Okay, that, that mantra go, goes like this, right? To predict mixing or predict solubility, right? to predict uh, uh, mixing or solubility, solubility of, uh, of covalent compounds, of course. Okay, the mantra is, like interacts with like. That's it. This is all you need to remember. Okay. Okay. Let's do an example. Okay. So let's think about water. Right. So water is is two O. Right. And let's try to try. Let's think of. Let's try to predict. A mixing of water with uh, something like I don't know. Some people, you know, you know, drink a molecule that contain. I mean, drink drink uh, drink something that contains this molecule over here. Does anybody know what this molecule is? Anybody? That yeah. We have to be more specific, Lux. Yeah, it is alcohol, but it is not just one alcohol. It is called ethyl alcohol. Okay, anyway, so okay, you know, in, in bars, they serve you, okay? This molecule with something else, like this molecule. All right, anyway, now uh, the question is, do you expect these two to mix with each other or not? So how do we predict this? So water molecules, all right? What types of intermolecular forces we have between water molecules? Do we have dispersion? Everybody. Yes, we have dispersion. Do we have dipole-dipole? Yes, because it's a polar molecule. Do we have hydrogen bonding? 
Yes, we have hydrogen covalently bonded to oxygen. Therefore, we have Hb as well, hydrogen bonding as well. All right. Now, let, let's take a look at uh, ethyl alcohol or ethanol in short. All right. Do we have dispersion? Everybody? Yeah, we have dispersion. Do we have dipole-dipole? Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a polar molecule. Therefore, we have dipole-dipole. Do we have hydrogen bonding? Yes, we have hydrogen covalently bonded to oxygen. Therefore, we have hydrogen bonding as well. Okay, so here's the thing. They have like interactions. Okay, so if they go to a party, they're going to talk to each other. They're going to hang out with each other. All right, therefore, we can predict that they are going to mix with each other. Okay, and this is what is meant by like interacts with like. All right, let's do another example while we're at it, okay? So let's think about, uh, what do we have in our gas tanks, gasoline tanks, gasoline? What do we have? O do we have octane? They, they say high octane, right? So let's do octane and water, okay? So, so here's water again, and I'm going to draw. I'm going to try to draw octane. This is why we love line structures, but it's much easier to draw line structures. Okay, so octane has eight carbons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's octane. Okay, now one more time. Water has dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. What about octane? Is it polar or nonpolar? Everybody, is octane polar or nonpolar? It's nonpolar. It's a hydrocarbon, meaning it only has hydrogen and carbon in it. Therefore, it is nonpolar for all intents and purposes, right? If it is nonpolar, what types of intermolecular forces do we have between these molecules? And then again, dispersion. What else? That's it, that's it, done, right? Nonpolar molecules only have that, all right? Now, let's imagine water and octane going to a party. Okay, will they talk to each other? No, because they don't have like interactions, like interest, all right? So octane will hang out with themselves rather than, going to, rather than talking to water. And the same thing with water. Without, water, water will hang out with themselves rather than talking with octane. Why? They don't have like interest. All right? So we can predict them to be not mixing, not mix. All right? And this is how we use this mantra, like interacts with like, to predict solubility of covalent compounds. All right? Now, with that in mind, can we take a look at this question again? By the way, C12, H22, O11 is something you might be consuming right now, some of you. Okay, some of you might have had this in the morning, okay? This is sucrose. You find this in sugar. And this is the molecule, sugar molecule. Yep. All right, we have 100% answers. Therefore, I'm going to close this question in five, four, Three, two, and one. All right, and here are our responses. This is not zero. This is top hat being weird here. Okay, uh, I know this is uh, anyway. Yeah, ninety percent. Anyway, so these are the correct answers. Ninety percent of us selected that, not zero here. Okay, I mean, you know, I, I know that most of us selected that. All right, what questions, concerns, comments do we have? Right? This is how we predict solubility. All right? We are looking at what, uh, what interactions, what kind of a molecule we have. If it is a polar molecule, they would interact with other polar molecules. If it is a nonpolar molecule, that nonpolar molecule will interact with other nonpolar molecules rather than interacting with a polar molecule. You know, that's how it goes. Yeah? All right. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Okay, now here's what we need to do. Now, we, need, we know that mixing is a process, right? And then any process 
uh, has two states. What are the two states of a process? Anybody who can remember? What are the two states of a process? We have what we have in the beginning or what we call the initial state and we have final state, okay? Those are the two states, initial state and the final state. And you know, we, and I, I think we can remember, some of us can remember what we did with that, right? What we did, did with that was we put the initial state and the final state in a diagram, an infamous diagram called, called what? Shh. Thank you. All right. What is, what is that's okay, that's okay. I was kidding. All right. So what is that diagram called? Any, anybody? The, the diagram is called? Thank you. Pick diagram or potential energy on the Y axis and the number of configurations on the X axis. All right. Yeah. The pick diagrams are back. All right. We're back with that. All right. You're going to see a lot of them uh, in your, in your, uh, in your exam 3B. All right. Now we are going to be doing the same thing with the mixing process as well. In the mix process of mixing, the initial state is called the unmixed state before mixing, and the final state is called the mixed state. Okay, sometimes they are referred to as the undissolved state and the dissolved state. They mean the same thing, okay? All right. Now, I want to point out something else here. So before things mix, let's say that we have, we have uh, this, okay? So let's say that we have... Um, substance A and substance B. Okay. Before they mix, in the unmixed state, we have A molecules interacting with other A molecules and B molecules interacting with other B molecules. In the mixed state, once they are mixed, we have A molecules interacting with B molecules. All right. This is just pointing out something obvious. Okay, this is what we have in the mixed state. Now, now I want to point out another thing right away. Where do we have a higher number of configurations if two things mix? In the unmixed state or the mixed state? On your whiteboards, go ahead. Let's, let's make an opinion here, okay? Let's, and let's find, I just want to find your opinion here. Where do we have a higher number of configurations? In the unmixed state or the mixed state if two things mix? Ten seconds, please. Please write your answer on your whiteboard. One more time. I want you to write where we have a higher number of configurations in the unmixed or the mixed. It's so interesting. Thing. I, I just want to get you to think about it. All right. Finish your whiteboards, everybody. I see. I see mixed. Mixed. Can't see, but I think it's mixed. I think mixed, mixed. Almost everybody said mixed. Yes, thank you. In the mixed state, you have more ways of arrangements, meaning more number of configurations if they mix. Okay. So if they, here's the key term here. If two things generally mix, you're going to see this word generally. Okay. Generally. All right. If the two things generally mix, the mixed state will have a higher number of configurations. If they don't, if the two things don't generally mix, then the mixed state will have a lower number of configurations. That is something you are going to see uh, time and again. Okay? All right. Now, here's a question for you. I talked about the number of configurations. Okay? Now, I want to move on to the other axis, the potential energy axis. Here's a question for you. Right? In green. If you are told that AB interactions are stronger than AA and BB interactions, okay, can you draw the pick diagram for this mixing process? Go ahead. If AB interactions are stronger than AA and BB interactions, uh, can you draw the pick diagram? All right, we have... Yeah, we have close to 90% answers. That's not reading, okay? All right. So I'm going to close this question in five, four, three, two, and one. Looks good. All right. So, so actually, you know what I was testing here? I was testing whether you could remember 
something we wrote in our notebooks in a previous life. Right? In a previous life, if you can remember, we wrote something like this. The stronger the attractive interactions, the lower the potential energy. Okay? You are told that AB is stronger or you have strong attractive interactions in the mixed state, meaning the mixed state must have a lower potential energy. That's all I was testing you there. Okay? All right. Anyway, so there are two peg diagrams with, with mixed state at a, at a lower potential energy, peg diagram one and peg diagram four. Both of them are accepted dances, right? Both one and four are accepted dances, okay? Why both one and four are accepted? Because I did not tell you whether AB generally mix or not, right? If I told you that A, B, uh, a and B generally is soluble in each other, then the mixture must have a higher number of configurations and one should be the answer. But because it wasn't specified, both peg diagram one and four are acceptable here. Okay. All right. What questions, concerns, comments do we have at this moment? Anything? Any questions, concerns, comments? All right. Now, I'm going to reopen that in case you want to revise the answers. Okay. Now, when it comes to, listen to this now for a second, okay? When it comes to these peg diagrams, there are six possibilities, okay? So what I've done is I've, I've made a video going over each of those peg diagrams, each of those six peg diagrams, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to post that on your D2L uh, sometime this evening, and then you should be able to find that here as well. I don't want to play, okay? So here, I mean, I have summarized everything that we have discussed today about mixing. On top of that, you will say that, you know. On top of that, I'm going over all the possible, right? All, all, all the possible peg diagrams. Okay? So when you get a chance, I recommend that you, you know, go over it and, you know, make sure it makes sense to you and make a few notes yourself and then maybe include that in your one-page note, okay? All right. Now, here are those six possible peg diagrams. What I want you to do now is I want you to tell me which one of, there are two peg diagrams. And you know what? I shouldn't have told you that. That's okay. I'm jumping the gun here. Okay. All right. So, so can you select all the, the, all the peg diagrams that depicts uh, a, a scenario where solubility increases when you increase the temperature? Okay. So if the if the solubility increases when you increase the temperature, what peg diagrams can describe that scenario? Go ahead. Thank you. All right. So I, I will. I will in a bit. Okay. All right. I'm going to close this question in five, four, three, two, and one. All right, just to let you guys in on um, what I'm doing here, All right? Just like we wrote in the previous life, the stronger the attractive interactions, the lower the potential energy. We also wrote something about, I hope it's here. Oh, there you go. There you go, this page, right? We wrote this together. I know it's a previous life, in the previous life, previous life, okay? All right, we also wrote higher temperatures favor the state with higher potential energy, okay? So you are told that increasing temperature is increasing the solubility, meaning increasing temperature is favoring the mixed state, meaning the mixed state must have a higher potential energy or lower potential energy. Thank you. Higher potential energy. And there are only two peg diagrams here where we have a mixed state at a higher potential energy, and those are C and D. Okay, so that should be one. So that's it. All right. I'll reopen. All right. 
What questions, concerns, comments do we have? Anything? Any questions, concerns, comments? Grace, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, what should we say? I'm, okay, I'm, I'm not good at repeating what I just said, but I might miss something. But anyway, um, so always start with what is given to you. You are told increasing temperature increases the solubility, meaning high temperatures favor the mixed state. Increasing temperature favors mixing or the favors the mixed state. Okay. So you know at high temperatures, the state with high potential energy, energy is favored. Therefore, the mixed state must have a higher potential energy. Okay, There are only two peg diagrams uh, we have with the mixed at a higher potential energy, that is C and D. Therefore, those should be your answer. Yeah? All right. Any other questions, concerns, comments? All right. Let's keep playing. Um. All right, by the way, because I'm looking at this, I want to mention this because even though it is not relevant to this particular question. So if you look at the uh, first three or the top peg diagrams, you have the mixed state at a higher number of configurations. So the first three peg diagrams of the top, top peg diagrams um, depicts generally soluble case. Uh, generally, Soluble. Why it is generally soluble? Because you have soluble. You have the mixed state at a higher number of configurations. If they if they are generally soluble, the mixed state has a higher number of configurations. On the other hand, the bottom three peg diagrams have mixed state at a lower number of configurations. Therefore, those three peg diagrams depict generally. I'm using this term generally because I've seen this somewhere. Okay, generally, generally insoluble. Okay, I just want to point that out because we are looking at it. All right, so with this in mind, shall we look at... Um, All right, can we try to do this? Text in bold, okay, it says that at zero degrees Celsius, 180 grams of sugar dissolves in 100 milliliters of water. At 100 degrees Celsius, 480 grams of sugar dissolves in 100 milliliters of uh, water. Okay, what that means is in simple words, the solubility of sugar increases when you increase the temperature, that's it. Right, without directly telling you that, they are giving you data so that you can come to that conclusion. All right, increasing temperature increases the solubility. That's what it says. All right, but I interpreted this for you now, but in the future, when you see them somewhere else, you should be able to do it by yourself. Like, you know, like, you know, look at the data and think about what it says. Yeah. All right, all right. So, how do we handle this? We need to use some some things that we know about sugar to handle this question. All right, you know, if you have been to the kitchen in this case, okay, that sugar dissolves in water. Therefore, okay, please pay attention to this. It's really important that you pay attention to this information. All right, Maya. Okay, so we have. Thank you. So we have to know that sugar generally dissolves in water. Sugar is generally soluble in water. Okay, why is that important? So that we won't pick anything from the bottom peg diagram. So these are out. Why we know sugar generally sugar is generally soluble in water. And then the second piece of information: you are also told that increase in temperature increases the the solubility meaning the mixed state must have a higher potential energy. There's only one peg diagram in the top three uh, where we have the mixed state at a higher potential energy, and that would be C, so that should be your answer. That's it. 
All right. Yes. All right. What questions, concerns, comments do we? I want to see it like what you did actually to get an idea. Oh, look at that. It should, you, you got to that answer without me. You don't need me anymore. I'm useless. I knew that. All right, let's do one more. Now, about intermolecular forces, okay? Here's another peg diagram for sugar dissolving in water, right? With that information, can you tell me where we have strong intermolecular forces? All right, I'm going to close this question in five, four, three, two, and one. Let's see. And here are our responses, okay? So most of us said, okay, our mixed state has stronger attractive interactions than the mixed state. And then the other, the second most popular answer is the other way around. Okay, at least we are there. All right, now, how do we tackle this? We know the mantra, not, not the mantra, yeah, it's the mantra, okay? The stronger the attractive interactions, the lower the potential energy, right? Here's what we wrote some time ago, right? The stronger the attractive interactions, the lower the potential energy. Therefore, the state with lower potential energy must have stronger intermolecular forces. And where do we have a lower potential energy? In the unmixed state, therefore, unmixed must have stronger attractive interactions than the mixed state. In other words, AA and BB interactions are stronger than AB interactions. That's what it means. Huh? All right. What questions, concerns, comments do we have at this moment? Any questions, concerns, comments? Yeah? All right, so if that is the case, I want to do two more questions. All right, I want to do this and come back to sugar again, okay? I think about this, all right? So here's how it goes. Now, you have water and methanol. This is, this is methanol, right? Water has uh, dispersion, Dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. And then CSCOH also has dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. So they have like interactions. Therefore, we can predict them to mix with each other. Okay? If that is the case, the mixed state must have a higher number of configurations, meaning uh, your option D is out. Okay, it has to be between A, B, and C. Now, you are also told that the solubility of methanol in water does not change with temperature. Okay, what does this tell us? It tells us that the potential energies of the mixed and the unmixed are comparable. Okay, that means they are similar. So, because if, if, they were, if they were different, then one state must be favored when you increase the temperature. So, the fact that they are not changing means the mixed and the unmixed must be at the same level, and that is option C. Right? So, C should be your answer for that. Let's see if Topper agrees. Oh, look at that. This is beautiful. This is good. This is not bad. Uh, I, one, one for the road, okay? One for the road. This is the easy one. This is easy. And then I'll, I'll open the, uh, the attendance code as well in case somebody's in a hurry to leave and watch election or something like that, you know.
one five four five is your attendance code. Now I have to open this. Oh, thank you. Now I have to take a picture of this. <laughs> 